not um, the most encouraging passage of scripture, but um, if your bro- older brother was going to kill you, you might be on the run too, right? So uh, we're, we're looking at this theme of nomads and neighbors. And uh, we've been watching in the news over the last couple of weeks with great sadness all the events that are unfolding in Afghanistan, talking about people fleeing. There's a country torn by war and suffering in great measure, and so many people who I'm sure love their country but no longer feel safe there for a variety of reasons, wanting to get out. And it's hard to watch in real time as we see this kind of suffering, as we see refugees, and yet so much of the history of the world is around people that are displaced from where they would like to be. Anywhere from 700 million to a billion people worldwide are displaced, Uh, most internally, but many externally as well, from where they would like to be. They can't be where they want to be. And I introduced you a few weeks ago to this diagram of uh, mobility and the four archetypes of mobility. So uh, you can move or not move, and then there's also freedom of choice. You're you're volunteering to move, or you want to move, or you you don't have the choice. You can't move. And uh, it, it just brings out four different uh, types of people, four different archetypes of individuals. So if you can move around and you have the freedom to move around, you can live a nomadic life, you can go be an expat somewhere, you can go travel. If you could do that, but you like your high mat, you'd rather stay home, then you're a settler and you, you stay in your home country or your home city. If you have to move, but you didn't want to move, like we see in the news currently, then you're a refugee. And of course, next week we'll talk about the prisoners who don't have any choice to move or not move. They're just stuck in one place. But refugees can be any number of reasons why they might flee. We've talked about war and uh, the situation in Afghanistan. We've seen that in so many places, even here in Europe in the 20th century. So many people uh, left and they, they went away because of war and because of difficulty. It might be economic reasons that people flee. Sometimes that's legal or illegal. Here in the EU, there's freedom of travel. I shouldn't say here in the EU. In the EU, of which Switzerland is not part. In the EU, you know, you can travel uh, from one country to another to find work. And so many people have traveled because there's not work in their home country. And they can do that legally. And some have come illegally because of jobs. Urbanization is a huge reason for people leaving small towns and villages in the countryside, going to the big city uh, for work or other factors of safety and so on, especially in China. There's big demographic change that way. Uh, Those are kind of macro levels. On the personal level, sometimes people have to leave where they are because they're not safe. It's a tragedy in, in families when Uh, women and children don't feel safe in their home and they have to move for reasons of safety or security or violence that they're experiencing. And so there might be reasons why people flee from their home or their upbringing and they're refugees somewhere else. Uh, A refugee is someone who would prefer to be where they are but they would prefer to stay where they are but they don't have the option. Something beyond their Uh, ability, something outside of them forces them to be moved and to change somewhere. And so some of you have come to Basel quite willingly and uh, you're happy to be here and others of you have come maybe less willingly. You've come along with the family, you're you're not exactly a prisoner, but man, you feel maybe a little bit like a refugee. I had to move in order for these things to take place. And we've talked about uh, a couple of these uh, types And today we want to talk about Jacob, the refugee. So we talk about Abraham, the the nomad, and Isaac, the settler. Jacob is a fascinating character. We could do a whole sermon series on him alone. We're going to try and summarize his story really quickly because there were three occasions in his lifetime where he had to be the refugee, where he had to flee from where he was in order to go somewhere else. Jacob was the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham, uh, he was a twin. He has an older brother named Esau, uh, who born a few minutes before him, who, and, and there's going to be problems with him. He's got an uncle back in the old country named Laban, 
that he is going to be involved with as well. And uh, so his story is uh, a complicated one, but involves a lot of him running or fleeing or having to go away. So the first case is in Genesis chapter 27 and 28, and we read a little bit about it a few minutes ago. Uh, he has a dispute with his brother Esau because he's stolen something. He's stolen basically the inheritance from his older brother Esau, who is the firstborn. His father is ready to, to bless Esau and make sure that he inherits the blessing, and he tells him, you go find me a, a wild animal and prepare me a meal, and then I will bless you. And while Esau is out doing that, Jacob disguises himself and goes into the father and says, it's me, Esau. So he went to his father and he said, my father, yes, my son, who is it? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. And I've done as you told me, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. And in this way, Jacob steals the blessing. He steals the inheritance of the firstborn from his brother Esau. And that was probably unwise because Esau was known as being a very good hunter. He knows how to use a bow and arrow. And you probably don't want to steal from him. And so Esau says, as we read in verse 41, you know, once dad passes away, I will be killing my brother and I will be settling this score. I'm not going to let this go. And so uh, Jacob's mother says, why don't you go back to the old country? You go to Uncle Laban and you stay with him for a while till this blows over. Hopefully your brother will forget about it. Boy, is that wishful thinking or what? So refugee experience number one, he's running for his life from his brother because he's stolen from him. Then he goes to work for this uncle, Genesis uh, chapter 31. He goes to work for Uncle Laban. He marries two of his daughters, so he has to pay for that. He works uh, 14 years for his uncle and then begins to work for his own uh, livestock, but he's always working for the uncle. His uncle is not a very nice guy. He's a very dishonest character. It's a very difficult relationship. Jacob is now able to raise some livestock for his uncle and some for himself. And Jacob becomes very wealthy in the midst of this. And this causes more family problems with the sons of Laban. And so Jacob heard them talking. And they said, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and gained all his wealth from what belonged to our father. That's not entirely true, but that's how they felt about it. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude towards him was not what it had been. And the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. So at one point he had fled for safety to his uncle Laban and now he's got to leave there again for the issue of safety. The Lord says, I think now is the time after about 20 years, you need to get out of this situation because it's not going to be safe for you. And while Laban is away for a couple days, Jacob takes all of his family and all of his possessions and tries to sneak away back to Canaan and uh, wants to kind of sneak out in the dead of night because uh, he's not safe there any longer. The good news is when he gets back to the uh, Canaan, he's able to make up things with his brother Esau. He's able to settle there. He has a family there. He has 12 sons. And uh, there's dysfunction in his family as well. And one of his sons, Joseph, has been missing for many years, presumed dead. But Joseph really wasn't dead. He was sold by the other brothers into slavery. And now he has gone down to Egypt and become the prime minister. And in uh, Genesis chapter 46 and 47, we read about Joseph uh, reuniting with his brothers because once again, there's a famine in the land. And so for reasons of famine, uh, Jacob's family is going to move down to Egypt because Joseph, the brother, will look after them. And so in Genesis uh, chapter 46, uh, Israel, who was now the, the, the other name of Jacob, set out with all that was his. When he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And the God uh, spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. 
And so this is a bit of an economic move, but he's also running towards a son who he thought was missing. And so each of the major moves in Jacob's life were not of his choosing. They were decisions that were made for him. And uh, he has great stories. He's a character worthy uh, of a lot of consideration, and, and there's more to each of these. But we can see why he fits the refugee profile. And when you're moving and you don't want to move, when you are forced to move by things that are happening outside of you, it can be disorientating. It can cause you to have questions. It can cause you to question God and what he's up to and why are these things happening in my life. It cause you to question the relationships you have with other people, the decisions that you have made. And you no longer have your own space. You no longer have that physical place where you are. That's being taken away from you. And now you find yourself somewhere else. And you're disorientated in that process. And it forces you, when you're a refugee, to figure out what is it that I really value in life? What is it that I'm really going to zero in on that's important? What really matters to me? Because when you have all of these things stripped away from you, then you have to sort of answer that question. You know, what, what really matters? What, what do I really value? If you watch the news when they're evacuating people from a hurricane or from a forest fire that's burning through neighborhoods, you'll see that people have only a few hours to get out of their homes. And uh, they can grab a few things to take with them in the car. And sometimes, you know, you see these million-dollar homes, and the flames are coming towards these homes. And the, these people have spent uh, all kinds of money on these homes. But what are they taking in the car? They're taking the family pets and maybe photo albums uh, when the kids were small. And, and the jewelry and the painting and the nice furniture, not so much. Because they've decided the things of value that really matter to them are not the things that they spend a lot of money on, but is something else altogether. And when we travel through life, we find ourselves in different locations, whether we're there as nomads or refugees or whatever, we can't take everything with us. We have to make some decisions. If you've ever moved internationally, and most of you have, you know how cathartic it is to get rid of a lot of stuff because you have to you you sort of realize I know some of you put it all in storage back wherever and now you're wondering why because it's been a long time you should have just got rid of it at the time but we we you know had a couple of international moves it's amazing how much junk you collect it's amazing what you got to give away when you're going to move and how it it pairs down your thinking about what's really important and so when we think about, well, what do we carry? What's important? We'll use Jacob's experience to try to answer some of that, as, not only as expats living internationally, but as Christian people here, as Hebrews describes as strangers and pilgrims and exiles in this world. Where, where do we place our value? Because the world would like to tell us what to value and where to spend our time and energy. And we can be very shaped by that because we want to fit in to the world around us. Or we can be shaped by scripture and stories like Jacob's that tell us this is what you should pay attention to. So what do we value as believers in this world, as people who belong to the kingdom of God but are living here now in this place? Well, one thing we want to value is relationship with other people. We want to value the walk we have with other people, especially family members. An NGO organization interviewed refugees who fled Syria in the early part of the war there about a decade ago. And they asked them this very question, what did you take with you when you had to leave? They all had to leave very quickly. Rama said that she sold all of her gold before the journey, except she kept a gold heart necklace that her mother had given to her when she had given birth to her first son. Um Shadi, who was age 50, said that they left so quickly that they brought nothing with them but the clothes on the back, uh, their clothes on their backs. But she said the most important thing she brought with her was her husband, Abu Shadi. He was very grateful, he says. 
Basma, age 15, says she proudly wears the watch that her aunt gave her for her birthday. It was a parting gift as they fled the country. Muhammad, age 18, he says that the numbers on his mobile phone are the most important thing that he brought with him to Sir from Syria because those numbers allow him to communicate with his friends and family who stayed behind. That's figuring out what's of value. The numbers on my phone, not even the phone, <laughs> was what he valued. It was the numbers because of what, oh, what did these things have in common? They, they were connections with people who mattered. They were connections with family. When they lost everything, what did they want? They wanted the connection with the family, with the people that mattered. Nobody said, uh, I took my car. Nobody said, I took that, you know, painting we paid a lot of money for. And you can't read Jacob's story and not get a sense of the family dynamics are a large part of what's at play here. It's part of his conflict in life. You read Abraham and Isaac, they're settling into a new culture and the conflict comes from outside. They have to deal with hostile people in the environment. You read Jacob's story and he's dealing with internal problems. I mean, most he causes his own, but it's all family dynamics. His parents p played favorites between him and his brother Esau. The bulk of the story turns on that relationship. And then there's the father-in-law. There's two wives and two concubines. He plays favorites with his children, which causes problems with Joseph. I'm not saying that his family is a good example. It's not. It just tells us the dynamics that are at play here and how important family is. And it highlights our, long, our lifelong family relationships and connections that we can't escape. Joseph's brothers thought they were rid of him, but it didn't happen. Jacob thought he could steal from his brother and get away with it, but in the end, he had to go back and make things right with that brother. And we value uh, relationships. We value family, but so much in our Western culture now says, well, if that person ticks you off, if they're t toxic, you just break relationship with them and you move on. And I think we have a, a calling to be much deeper and to value much more the people that God has placed into our lives. Friends, for sure, but family especially. This is not optional. God has given us relationship to, to build with those people, to care for them, and not say, well, I moved away and they never keep in touch with me. No, we will keep in touch with them. Uh, Jacob and his sons couldn't be freed from uh, ignoring all of that, they had to keep facing family and what they were doing to one another. And it, it didn't matter. They, they had to keep coming back to that and working on that relationship and trying to get it right. And so there's something uh, so important about the people that God has placed into our lives that we need to stay connected with and value. Second thing, of course, is the relationship with God and remembering those times when he has really spoken into our hearts and lives. Y you know, we, we take special memories. We, relationships are built uh, around shared memories. We, we share a, a family holiday. We go camping. It rains every day. Somebody slips and breaks their ankle. We get the cars broken down, and it's just... A, a, a terrible week and yet the family talks about it for years as if it's the most wonderful thing because they shared this experience together and they made it through. Relationships are built on that kind of thing and we don't have a photograph of our relationship with God but we do have stories, we do have moments from our life with God that we need to remember and that we need to carry with us into our different places where we are because it tells us about our walk with God. And we build a memorial. When Jacob ran from God the very first time, he's running away from his brother. He sleeps in a field. He uses a rock for a pillow. And while he sleeps at night, he has a dream that God is in that place. That's like a stairway to heaven. And he wakes up in the morning and he takes that stone and he sets it up as a memorial stone. And he calls the place Bethel, the house of God, because he said God was here and I didn't even know it. God is looking after me. Even though I've done this foolish thing, God is with me. And I, I, I want to acknowledge that. And he creates this memorial and reminder that God was looking out for him. 
and this is something we do in our life and in our walk with God, to remember those times when God has provided and cared and walked with us in the midst of our challenging circumstances. I remember when I quit my job to go to seminary full-time, believing that God had called us to ministry, and, and this was the path, and so I'd given up my job, and Rhonda, my wife, had just taken a temporary job teaching at a school. They said, we think it would be enough cl- children this fall will have two classes, and so they hired her. And in the first week of school, they discovered they didn't have enough students, and so they fired her. And they said, we have no position. And so now, it was a Thursday night, and both of us are sitting there without jobs, uh, without any money in the bank, me enrolled in studies, and wondering, you know, what are we going to do? And just having to pray and call out to God to take care of us. And over the course of that weekend, something opened up, and they said there's a a part-time job available. You could start Monday, and it's a permanent contract, which was good because it provided the benefits and would be a door in, but it was really less money than we needed. It wasn't quite enough, but we decided that that was the right thing. And then she showed up at work uh, that Monday, and the principal said, well, this is a 50% job, but... I've got another 40%. If you're willing to do that, you can have a 90% job on this permanent contract, and then next year it'll be 100%. And it was more than we needed, and it was was a huge blessing. And so many times in our life when we've come to a point where we're just like, our, our plans have ended, and God, what's next? We tell that story. We, t- we tell it to each other. We, we tell it to our kids because we want them to know that we have this walk with God that, that, that reminds us of how we get through the difficulties that we face. And whether we face that in Canada or our time in Azerbaijan or different experiences we've had here in Switzerland, we know that God is with us and has provided and cares for us. And so we, we have some other memorial stones that we tell one another and we tell our family. We carry those with us from place to place because they're a reminder of God's provision and care and love. And you need to know your stories. You need to carry your stories of how your walk with God has evolved and changed and where God has shown up because you're going to need that in the days ahead as you move on. It might have been financial provision. It might have been a physical healing. It might have been a spiritual experience. It might have been a word from God at the right time, but it's worth building a memorial. It's worth setting up a stone and saying, this is when God was my helper. And Jacob does that in his life and recognizes that God is with him. The last thing he carries with him are his life lessons. I don't know what else to call them. The the book of Proverbs tells us to get wisdom, to, to learn from our mistakes and experiences and to pay attention. And the one thing about Jacob that is significant is more than any other of the patriarchs, his character changes. He grows. Abraham is this giant of faith. Abraham just seems to come ready to believe God and never have any difficulty. Jacob is kind of this schmucky guy who lies and steals and deceives people. But you know what? He changes over time. And this is what gives us hope. As, as people who are less than perfect, as people who don't come with this great faith right away. We can look to somebody like Jacob and we say, well, if he can learn his lessons, if God can be with a guy like that, then maybe God can be with somebody like me. And I will learn and I will grow. And he changes his behavior. He has to, to go back to Esau and admit that he made a mistake in what he did and to set things right. And he's got to deal with that experience. He's He's planning in in Genesis chapter 32 to go back. He has to leave his uncle. He's going back to Canaan. He's got to face his brother. He knows that there's problems. He's learning to be more caring. He's learning to be diplomatic. He's bringing gifts. He's, He's concerned about this. He's wandering around the middle of the night, and this stranger comes to him, and they begin to wrestle, and he's wrestling with God. And he, he's wrestling with God, and he finally realizes what's happening, and he says, I want you to bless me. And the angel of the Lord, or God, who's wrestling this theophany, says, okay, well, what's your name? Now, this is what got Jacob into trouble 20 years earlier, because he didn't give his name. He used his brother's name to get a blessing. 
But this time he uses his name. He said, yeah, I'm Jacob. My, I'm the deceiver. I'm, I'm the one that's calling out. And so God says, okay, I'm going to bless you. And uh, I'm going to call your name Israel. And you're going to be fine. But he touches his hip. And now Jacob walks the rest of his life with a limp. Another one of those memorial stones. Another part of his relationship with God that he carries through his life. And in chapter 35, he's able to confess that God has been with him wherever he was and that God has been the source of his blessing. And that's progress because Jacob didn't seem that interested in God at the beginning. And where we live in in a time and place, you know, God has lessons for us. We've been learning some life lessons. Have you been paying attention to that? Have you been growing from those experiences? Are, Are you able to start putting them down at a certain age in life? I think we're able to start writing down, these are the life lessons I've learned. These are the mistakes I've made and I've learned from them and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to categorize them. I mean, at a very simple level, you've all learned how to go through airport security. We, we don't do it the same way we did 20 or 30 years ago, do we? And yet there's always that person in front of us in the security line. Chains on their outfit, three belts, buckles up their boots... And you're just like, why? Like, do you not know, like, the rules for getting through here? Have you not learned this, you know? But we've learned some lessons. And we've learned to make it a little bit easier. And so we want to carry those lessons. What are things that God has taught you about life, about relationship, about being kind, uh, about being generous, about being loving, uh, about listening to him the first time? You've learned more than you probably know in your walk with God. It's time to begin articulating that and carrying with that that wherever you find yourself, you know that God has prepared you and given you some lessons and you're growing as a person and life will become easier for you rather than harder for you. We're nomads. We're on the move. We're in different places. We're neighbors. We live here and now in this culture and context. And I think it's important that we live in the moment where God has placed us. As Christians, we don't live for the moment, but we live present in the moment where we are. We should be enjoying life to the fullest. And and even though we may not be where we would like to be, we have some things that will help us stay anchored. We have family and friends. We have relationships, people that will stay connected to us. We have those memorial moments from God. Even when he's quiet and hidden in a new place, we still have the past that speaks to us and says, but he's proven himself. We have those lessons that we've learned, hopefully, that we're learning from that would prepare us. And they keep us anchored. And it's not about the job, and it's not about the money. It's not about the travel. It's not about the esteem. It's about the people in our life. It's about our walk with God. It's about things that that will not be burned up in the fire. And we learn to value some of these intangibles when we learn to live as refugees. God has us here for a purpose. And we should never pass over that too quickly. Short time or a long time, he's at work in our hearts and lives. And we always want to be present to know what God is saying to us. Let's pray. Lord, we're encouraged by the examples in scripture of people who were successful with you and people who failed and people who had to start over again. We're grateful for the lessons we've learned in our own life, for the times that you have shown up in difficulties and and the times that we've discovered we can count on you even when things are quiet. And Lord, maybe this morning there are some who are like, I'm not happy where I am in this place or I'm not happy where I am in this stage of life but I pray that they would stay anchored with you and with those that you've placed around them. They would patiently uh, enter into what you have for them here and now and know that this is not a waste of time, but you're continuing to be at work in their lives. May we all be open to what you want to do in our hearts, Lord, and just trust that you are present in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.